Hamilton, the Minister of Newco Patrick Parish, and thank you for making the time to share with us today. Being the Presbyterians we are, we don't play a huge importance to the festivals of the church in the way that other denominations do. Easter, we've always done that, but we don't hugely emphasise Lent. Christmas is actually fairly new. It was just a working day for my grandfather. Pentecost sometimes, but not all saints. And Reign of Christ, we've hardly heard of that. Reign of Christ Sunday is the last Sunday of the church year, which is today. So I only want to whisper this next bit, but Advent begins next Sunday. Can you believe it? Reign of Christ began almost a hundred years ago, instituted by the Pope in 1925 in response to the growing secularism and nationalism of the day. Jesus was ruler, not the gathering nationalism, populism, secularism that was going around. Now, I'm not sure how much difference it has made given a century later, we are still in the same situation of nationalism, secularism and populism. In Euclid Patrick, we have observed it over the last few years. But somehow we sit uncomfortably with it because of the juxtaposition of what it implies about Jesus, reign of Christ, and what we actually experience about Jesus, which is where we are today, trying to work out how we speak of Jesus in a world that sees power quite differently from the way faith originally did. Holy God and broken Jesus, away from the crowns and gold, the thrones and talk of kings, broken Jesus, away from the angel trains and the soldiers of Christ, broken Jesus by the pavements and alleyways, the deserts and the abandoned villages, may we shift our perception, O God, of your reign and let go the world's language and expectations and presumptions and make space for the lesser, more vulnerable, more costly reign of love. May we find kingdom words within the poorest and least, those the world denies and forgets, leaves hungry and without vaccinations. Open our eyes, O God, to the vulnerable kingdom that cannot compete with the world's wealth and forgive us for clothing you in unrighteous garments and golden thrones 
that make you feel uncomfortable and a religion that has its own vaults filled with power and wealth and authority. May we give you a home in a faith that seeks not outward power or strength or authority, but in the relationships we build, the community in which we participate, the parish we share. Reigning with a love as generous as it is unconditional, hear us as we say the global prayer together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today we find ourselves towards the end of Jesus' story. He's been arrested and he's been brought before Pilate. It's like two characters mixed up in someone else's issues about religion and faith and power. Reading this story now feels a bit out of sync, I know, but it illustrates an important point when we have this significant day called Reign of Christ. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the King of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say, I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice.
contemporary retelling of the story we've just heard. It was the night of the Passover and Jesus had been arrested. Judas's kiss had sealed his fate and he'd been taken away into the night. They would have him tried six times before the cockerel crowed in the morning. Jesus was taken to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate swept into his headquarters angry. It had been a long night. He summoned Jesus, looked him up and down, the blood on his face and arms, the hair matted, the clothes torn, the smell sharp. None of this affected Pilate. He saw this daily. It was the silence, the way Jesus met his eyes. Are you king of the Jews? He asked impatiently. It was what Pilate had been told people were calling this man standing before him. Is this your own question or are you repeating what others had said? Jesus responded. Pilate paused and looked Jesus up and down once more. Shrugged his shoulders. I'm not a Jew, am I? This conversation was yet again another that he was fed up with. The petty religious sensibilities of a culture he neither understood nor was interested in. Your own priests handed you to me. Why? What have you done? I don't have a kingdom here, Jesus replied. If I was a ruler here, would not my followers rise up and fight and keep me from being handed over? This isn't close to being my kingdom. So you are a king, Pilate asked. Your words, not mine. I am here only to speak to the truth, and those who belong to the truth recognise my voice. Pilate shook his head. Truth? Bah. It seemed such a hollow word and a waste of time. He left Jesus and went to speak to the priests again. Hopefully, this would be over soon. reign of Christ. It used to be called Christ the King. All very imperial. And that's the problem. It's the juxtaposition that's important today. The awkwardness between the title of the day, reign of Christ, and how actually that's meant to mean the exact opposite of the words we use. We talk in imperial language, while the real Jesus just knocks that on the head and wants to spin it in an entirely different way every time. We're so used to imperial language for God. In our hymns, rejoice the Lord is King, onward Christian soldiers, crown him with many crowns. We're always ultimately erring on the side of that kind of language, kingship, thrones, subduing nations. And it just feels wrong, so unlike Jesus. Yet the church has turned him into a king that he has always denied. And it's all the more important now because there are too many pretenders to the world's thrones who seek strength over folk, break rules, and even eat away at democracy itself. Jesus speaks wholly other to this, of loving the least, being a servant to all, with a self-giving love that loses everything. But we believe and talk as if love must win. But does it? That's an imperial outcome. Someone has to win. But that means that some other has to lose. It's as if God's people are clinging on for some victory because we can't live in the world any other way. There are only winners and losers. What if the reign of Christ is simply the ability to give without the idea of winning at all? That if the reign of Christ is simply only about giving of self without the caveat of reward or that love will win? Perhaps love wins every time it gives of itself completely and abundantly to those who understand it least and abuse it most without any comeuppance. It gives of itself and in the eyes of the world it loses because there is no reward. There is no final reckoning. It's just giving of itself. No caveat, no red lines, no exceptions. It just gives to the end. That doesn't fit well in the world, but neither does it fit well in the church. We want love to win, 
But then that's not love that we're talking about. And Jesus seems to agree. That is the world that defines Christ as king, not how Jesus himself talks or lives. The philosopher Alfred North Whitehead said that a humble Christ was short-lived in the early church and the deeper idolatry of fashioning God in the image of Egyptian, Persian and Roman rulers was retained, he says, and goes on, the church gave unto God the attributes which belonged exclusively to Caesar. Something we have to be constantly careful of as we refashion the church and how we speak faith's hope into the world after pandemics and seek the leaders who will guide us through. There is no hidden Caesar in Christ. Christ's reign is of love given with nothing returned. No reward for being true to the faith. It is truly selfless and abundantly generous. There is no winner. And that's a lesson we keep missing in the world. A poem, Calling All Kings, by Michael Coffey. Let those men who know and trust their inner king, who trust their own power and don't misuse it, who live beyond themselves, who see their greater vision, who seek blessing for all, who create order out of chaos, who foster peace in themselves and others. Let them embody their king today, humbly yet boldly, fearlessly and with joyful strength. For this world is short on mature men who know they have generative power to give life away. And so many turn to false kings, boys who think a crown costume is all they need, who stomp and plunder and turn the land to ruin, who sound the war siren without counting the cost, and forget that caring for the weakest among us and uniting the land as one are the reason there are kings at all. Thank you for joining us again today. Thank you for the invitation to join you. It's a wee bit blustery out here today, so um, apologies for some of the noise on the videos this week. But just to let you know that we are online, as always, nthchurch.org.uk, and there you'll find the diary in the front page of all the things that are happening. This Sunday, that's the 21st, in the evening at seven o'clock, there is a Songs of Praise. And then on Monday at seven o'clock on Zoom, as well, there is a quiz night, our usual weekly quiz night. Then on Tuesday afternoon, we have Sing Song at two o'clock and at 7.30, the Men's Association on Zoom on Tuesday evening. The bulletin comes out Thursday evening and then there's Coffee Pot at 10.30 um, on Friday morning on Zoom. So please do join us if you can for any of these events. Over the last couple of weeks or so we've had COP26 and we like to create an opportunity for people to pledge the, to the planet of an activity that you will pick up or stop doing and turn them into leaves and we're going to create a tree in our window for the whole community to see and add these leaves as they come in. You can pick them up on the website or pick one up in the church office on a Sunday morning and you can send it back to us and we'll add all these leaves to the tree and create a pledge tree for the planet. So please do take part in that if you can. And we hope to see you next time. Take care. Let's join all these activities that we have together in our prayers for others. Let us pray. Creator, Emperor of the poor and the forgotten, King among the homeless and stateless, we gather round the needs of the world and pray, not for a magic touch, but for a relationship with justice, with creation, with peace, with compassion. And in that relationship, we pray for Afghanistan and Yemen, for Belarus, Tigray and Sudan, 
And too many places still in conflict and pain for the lives of the poorest because of the policies of the wealthiest and the competition between states and nations and leaders. For the future of too many caught up in uncertainty, in a pandemic yet to stabilise, vaccines yet to be shared, an environment yet to be loved back, communities yet to be grown. For those in our parish and communities where there is pain and loss, where there is anxiety and mental ill health, where there is fear among women on these very streets we know, and for our families and our friends and the ill and the worried. For them all, we pray. Prayer, the relationships we have with love, the promise to live alongside the least, the way we build and shape and grow the kingdom, your kingdom. No king or emperor, but companion and servant of all. Hear us. So be it. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the common life of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.